All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Ultra High Net Worth Clients Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Broadhead. Today, we have the pleasure of talking with Daryl Lyons. Daryl, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Yeah. Uh, Daryl Lyons, CEO and co-founder of PAX Financial Group. I'm from uh, the San Antonio area and uh, grew up around South Texas, uh, kind of the area that's San Antonio um, and south towards the border and some of the small towns I lived in there and um, uh, currently live in New Braunfels, which is slightly north of San Antonio. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Which uh, also isn't far from Austin as well. Um, no, it's we're right I'm in between. Understand. So it's, yeah, I get to enjoy both of the towns. Nice. I'm partial nice. to San Antonio though. Yeah. yeah. I, like my, <laughs> I like my spurs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's awesome. So can you tell us how you got into this wild world of financial investing? Yeah. So, advising? um, you know, when I was, I remember when I was in high school, we uh, had a little uh, single white trailer on the side of the highway and of uh, highway 90 in town called Castroville, small little Texas town, Friday night lights kind of stuff. And I'm edging the uh, mobile home and you have plastic skirting and you got to be careful you, that you don't get the weed eater too close or you'll crack the skirting. And I thought, you know, how do people have houses with foundations? And so I kept thinking about that. And one of my friends, uh, her dad was a banker and he had a nice house with a foundation. They did as a family. And I thought, well, I want to, I guess I'm going to be a banker. That's sounds like I can get a house with a foundation. So I went to, I went to St. Mary's university and there was a bank right next to the university. And, um, uh, I, I went there like six or seven times to ask for a job and they kept losing my resume, but they finally gave me a job. I was very, very persistent, and that's how I paid my way through school. So 35 hours a week, I was a very consistent for four years. Um, I got a degree in accounting, another one in finance, and then went to do some graduate work later. But um, I ended up abandoning the banking career path. Um, at the time, when I graduated, Nations and Bank of America had this mega merger, and all my key contacts had lost their job. And so I, there was a little unsettling feeling. So. I took my accounting and finance degree in the banking background, and I kind of explored career paths, and, and I came up with a career in a, a certified financial planner. And I had no idea what that was, by the way, but I thought that's an, I, I think I I'm, I have some inclinations towards this career path. So I started working at a big firm, and I was doing really well, uh, rookie of the year, partner of the year, moving up to Chicago or Dallas or New York, and um, decided that that wasn't for me and I wanted to raise my family in the San Antonio area and wanted to be a business owner. So I quit and uh, got married and started with a couple other guys, PAX Financial Group. It's Latin for peace. And we started that, gosh, 2007 now. Wow. Okay. Right. Right before the party started. Yeah, I know. Timing of it. Yeah. Not my, I started in the industry in 99. So that was like dot com kind of stuff. And then that bubble burst. So I feel like I've been battle tested in a lot of these yeah. uh, economic ups and downs. And so as we're going through one now, it honestly, I mean, I don't like it. It's frustrating, but I, it, it, I, I never thought I'd get to the place where I feel emotionally disconnected. I'm very cerebral about it now. And I, that just comes with life and, and maturity and um, but it doesn't discount the fact that clients get emotional. So I just have to, I have to play that role. And I lead to, I, we have 25 employees, so I have 10 other advisors. So sometimes advisors will get emotional. I just have to be, you know, real steady and cerebral and use deductive reasoning and logic and draw conclusions. And, um, and those skills have just been built because of the many years of not responding that way and, and, and being emotional and regretting some of the decisions that were rooted in emotion. So, um, so I'm thankful for those. I think I'm thankful for those times. They they made me who I am today. Yeah, I mean, talk about trial by fire. Do you yeah. do you have any specific strategies for staying rational and not emotional during kind of these wild swings? Uh, yeah, good good question. Um, there's product strategies, there's financial planning strategies, and then there's also business acumen strategies, right? Um, so I can discuss any of those. Um, but the business acumen is, um, uh, I, I really like to root myself. I've got like key phrases that, that I use that my team can repeat. Um, uh, you can see behind me, I have got these phrases even on my wall. You might, you probably can't see it from that angle, but like one of them is uh, high emotion leads to low financial IQ. Um, 
and 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 these are just things that you've just got to con constantly repeat to yourself and others. Um, I tell my team almost every day, you think different when you think long term. So in my mind, a strategy to your point is being the chief reminding officer of re reminding myself and others of key principles that have been timeless. Now, those that know me, I, I am a Bible beater. So I've read the Bible many times. There's over 2000 scriptures and money. And many of those have influenced me and give me a, a principles that also guide me. So, I mean, I am a principle based guy. So I repeat those things. Uh, to myself and my team, and then they use that to guide them and weather the the emotional ups and downs. Mm. That's great. Any great insights uh, from the Bible uh, having to do with money that come to mind? Oh, goodness, You're there's so many. I mean, one of them is just as simple as, I think it's in um, Luke 14, 28, it says, who first built a tower without counting the cost and estimating how much it'll cost to build? I mean, I know that's real simple, but that's just practical stuff. Like, you know, sit down, let's pencil, let's pencil this thing out. That's 2000 years old, right? It's just, yeah. you know, let's think through this. Let's, let's see if the math works. Let's see if the economics work. Let's not make decisions on emotions or ideas that sound good. Or even like when I was early in the business, I'd meet a wholesaler that would come in. This was back in the day and he'd pitch me an investment strategy. He sounded good. The investment strategy sounded good. But at the end of the day, there really wasn't much evidence to support that that would translate into a future in, uh, performance. So I think just, uh, you know, we've got the word of God that t gives us some very logical reasoning and, and there's tons of them. Um, I mean, there's so many um, you know, I even think about Solomon. He was the richest man in the history of the world. And, and um, God said to him, because you didn't ask for riches or honor or the death of your enemies, and you didn't ask for a long life, but instead you asked for wisdom and knowledge um, to be able to rule over the people that I made you king. And I just think about that, too, about how important it is Solomon didn't ask God for riches or honor, but rather ask for knowledge and wisdom. So I think that if we kind of anchor ourselves into wisdom and how do we, you know, gain wisdom in this business and where can we go for wisdom? The money may or may not come, but um, it's, it's, I, I think it's a, it's a worthwhile pursuit because I've seen a lot of dumb people accumulate wealth and it only accentuates their foolishness. And then it, then it uh, magnifies, uh, I've worked with lottery winners and very wealthy people and, uh, or people that have inherited money and money only amplifies poor behavior. It only amplifies bad habits. It only amplifies bad people. And so I think that pursuit of wisdom, how can I refine myself in such a way that I'm not so self-centered? And then when you do receive money, you're good, you're a good steward of it. And so that's what I've seen over the years working with, I mean, kneecap to kneecap, I've worked with tens of thousands of people and I've been very poor and I've been very rich. And, um, and, and I really would say that that idea of Solomon really anchoring to wisdom, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When wisdom, uh, comes first before wealth. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, I want to take a step back. You said when you started, you were rookie of the year for your company you worked for. Can you tell us, uh, you know, some of your strategies for finding clients when you started? I mean, I don't know if they work. So the thing about it was, is when I graduated I, the day after I, uh, the day after I went to work for this company, and I thought I honestly thought they were going to give me a salary, and when I didn't get my check, I I. I realized that was on commission only. And I honestly, I just totally misinterpreted that. Like I thought I was getting a salary and here I am commissioned. So I'm in this bullpen and I look at the girl next to me and I said, Hey, I, did I misunderstand now? I thought I was getting like 2000 or $2,500 a month. She goes, no, I thought so too. So it wasn't just me. It was her also. I think we just got pitched and uh. it was a, um, it was a, yeah. Anyway, so I, I was like, well, what do I do now? Do I quit? And I was like, nah, I'm not going to quit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this thing. <laughs> so I did, but I only knew college kids and people in trailer parks. So um, my idea of getting clients was um, knocking on doors. I was like, I didn't know anybody rich. So I knocked on thousands of doors. I mean, I got kicked out of high rise buildings, um, mobile home parks, residential areas. I mean, I was like Edward Jones on fire. And, um, 
so I was six months into the business and I hadn't got any business. So they gave me a, a notice saying, Hey, if you don't close X amount of um, business in a few months, then you're, you're out of here. And I was like, well, dude, I need to, I need to get something. So I just, this was awesome. I bumped into this guy and um, I had just started to anchor to this thing, maybe even a sales pitch that they taught me about buy sell agreement. Didn't know much about it, but I, but I threw everything at him and he said, yeah, we need a buy sell agreement. I was like, man, thank God. So I brought in a guy with some gray hair. He helped me close the deal, gave me enough um, momentum to, um, to keep my job. And then after that, I started pitching those buy sell agreements a lot more. And I started funding life insurance. That was kind of my angle. I was funding life insurance policies and I kind of figured that out, but I would just get business owners just by knocking on doors. And, um, and then, and then I would say, I got like, it was crazy. This one lady, as an example, her name was Sandy. She didn't buy anything from me or invest anything, but she would give me referrals all the time. Maybe she liked me. I don't know, but she would give me referrals all the time. So I'd get a referral to her attorney. And then I would ask that attorney for referrals. And then this, it wasn't long before my, you know, with these people I was knocking on doors, I had this huge, I had like hundreds of people in my database because I just kept asking for referrals. Every, every cheesy referral strategy that was out there, I did and tried. Um, I, I had no pride because I was like, man, I had nothing to lose. I was, I was a poor kid from not much. I had nothing to lose. I had no pride. I just wanted to make it in this world. Uh, my goal was make sixty six thousand dollars a year, and I thought that was that was good enough. But um, I say all that because my strategy was just um, just kind of a relentless pursuit, more than anything. Mm -hmm. Probably something I wouldn't do again today. That's for sure. <laughs> so we this is our twenty something uh, interview, and I've heard a lot of relentless pursuit stories, but I think you're the first uh, door to door. Who, who was relentless enough to do that so man co cojones is on you brother well you know they they'd say that i a little integrity issue but they'd say like okay no soliciting i'd walk in they say hey didn't you see that I, no i didn't see it you know i just i mean i did everything like i could figure out i i remember like i even now i'm like man that was that was that was probably an integrity violation i shouldn't have done it like i would call car dealerships because i was like man those guys are making money so i'd call them and i'd say hey um, I was in there the other day and your top salesman, um, what was his name? Uh, and then the lady would say, oh, James Smith. Yeah, James Smith. Can I speak to James Smith? And I, they would just give me the name of the top salesman. I figured he was making money. So then I would pursue that James uh, Smith. So, I clever. mean, it, it was a lot of clever. It was a lot of <laughs> trying and failing. And uh, But, you know, like I said, I, I ended up becoming rookie of the year and then uh, partner of the year. I had like 10 people that was – 12 that were really working and producing underneath me um but the career path was clearly i was going to um mm. to big city and uh, you know i just this is home for me and 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 i don't have um an appetite for really fancy things and a fancy lifestyle to be honest i like yeah. nice things but but not 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 what i think not where i was headed mm -hmm. yeah keep it yeah. keep it simple yeah that that's that's awesome so when did it when did the idea materialize like oh i want to start my own thing it was like well it, it never was lost to me when um in the 80s when we had the snl savings and loan crisis and um uh S S san antonio was not immune to that uh, there was a lot of there was an oil crash snl crisis this was 87 my dad was my mom my mom my mom had me when she was 16 my dad was 20 so they didn't have much of an education and so um, my dad was doing good in his business, but he worked for a company and then that SNL crisis happened. He put his key in the door to go show up to work one day and it didn't work and they basically fired him. Um, that was like the tipping point in our family's history that I remember financially we we struggled from then on. That was mm -hmm. we had a nice house, we had a boat, we had <clears throat> some cars. But at that point, <clears throat> I mean, I just remember that was kind of like the point in my life where I saw my dad cry <clears throat> and I thought, well, I never want to work for somebody again if that's going to happen to me. That was my thinking. Yeah. And so th that never lost on me as I was in this career path. And that was part of the catalyst for me to start PAX. And so me and two other guys, so three of us, we ended up getting together and we started PAX. And that was in 2007. We left a big in a big firm um, and we wanted our independence because we felt that there was some conflicts of trying to sell product through us. Um, it was hard to be an independent advisor when, when you always had to sell something. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so we wanted to pursue that um independence and um well, i bought one of them out very amicably he's a dear friend today i talked to him today but the um, two of us stayed and then we've since added other um partners to the organization awesome, awesome. long answer short question sorry to be so no these are great that's yeah. that's what i want so 2007 you start pax you're, you're like everything's gonna be good certainly there won't be the largest swing correction in a hundred years yeah how, how'd you guys maintain um honestly we we hooked up with dave ramsey um you know the national syndicated talk show host we were one of his her early um endorsed local providers i don't know if you're familiar mm-hmm. with that program but oh. um he you know he's the national syndicated talk show host out of nashville a uh, self-proclaimed you know hillbilly he um uh he he needed somebody to send leads to so he sent it to us and man during 2007 2008 when people were nervous they came to us and we were seeing a lot of people and that was a blessing um so we were just seeing people left and right 2007 2008 we were just i mean i i was probably seeing six people a day and wow. it was just one after another but it was all like a shares so american funds so that's how the the economic system and the financial advisory system worked at that day you know that those times people came in you got a commission for selling american funds whatever product um the the actually more trying time was 2011 hmm. when we made an attempt to be a little bit more sophisticated i think we were just trying we were trying new things um and 2011 we started to um well, it was a tricky time period because we had a decade, 2001 to 2011, where you looked at the decade and it was called the lost ec- decade of the S&P 500. And, and we were becoming concerned that we were um, no longer able to pr- bring value to anybody's life if we continued to um, have a stock market with zero return. So we were like, we got to do something different. And at that time, we weren't the only ones thinking this way. So this algorithm trading started to become prolific in our industry. And so we subscribe to these algorithms we hired a hedge fund manager um we subscribe to the technician stuff where red lights you sell green lights you buy and we um we actually adopted that uh clients we did some presentations clients said yeah we like that we're tired of zero returns we want something different so um we did that but in 2011 right in the summer greece was about to collapse the european union came last second and bailed them out but it caused a whipsaw where the green lights and red lights were flashing left and right. And we were trading and losing money, not just like minor losses, permanent losses of capital. You know, when Apple goes down, you expect it to eventually go back up. But when mm-hmm. you're trading and you sell at a loss, that's a permanent loss. So that was 2011. That was actually harder than 2007. For 2007, ignorance was bliss. But 2011, we had actually made some mistakes. Um, and, and it wasn't like integrity mistakes. It was, there was a lot of, everybody that was doing this type of, uh, investment approach was was in a pickle because of the whipsaws. So, but that set us back a little bit, not only in our confidence, but in our clients' confidence in us. So, it took us years to recover out of that, um, but eventually we did, and we were able to kind of uh, course correct and kind of. That's a part of us going back to principles of investing. Um, focus more on uh, crockpot investing than microwave investing, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that sounds like. Uh a expensive lesson that was very thoroughly learned maybe Dude, oh, it was so expensive <laughs> it was so stinking <laughs> expensive oh my gosh like i've just like i man you know just all the things that i've done over the years like man what an idiot but i'm so thankful i'm still here today to survive and i do i do my best to learn from these things like i don't let those lessons i tell my kids hey you don't lose you learn and I'm just so thankful to be here today and take these lessons and actually help people. Like, I feel like I'm pretty equipped to be able to say, man, I'm, I, yeah, man, I've been down there. That's, let's not do this. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's kind of made, it's made me, I'm, I'm thankful that I'm still here alive to be able to, to serve people. It's been, yeah. I mean, sincerely a blessing. Amen. So th- throughout your career, did you focus on a certain type of client that you felt you could serve best? And, and if so, you know, why, why did you choose them? We don't necessarily, we focus on a specific client. We have 1500 households. We have a lot of different 
uh, demographics. Um, we've got people just starting out. We've got ultra high net worth people. Um, but, you know, we tend to gravitate towards that business owner. M you know, my parents, since the, the challenges that they've had, they've started businesses. My brother started a business. My sister started a business. You know, here I am at PAX. So I am en endeared to the business owner. So we do have a 401k division. We do have a group health division. And we just started um, a business succession consulting uh, engagement service. So we do find ourselves um, very um, equipped and um, as a competitive advantage, because we are business owners and we, you know, we we're dealing with this stuff all the time, you know, whether it's payroll or finding out tech systems or whatever, we're, we're, uh, we're dealing with business owner kind of stuff. So we're endeared to the small business owner. Um, I've lobbied for small business through National Federation of Independent Business Owners, both in, in Texas and D.C. <clears throat> and so um, th that's that's the space that we tend to um do well in and so if anything i would suggest to you it's the small business owner small business owner you you see yourself you see your family in them yeah yeah it's a grind you know and and um you know, your identities in it and yeah I, i'm trying to figure out and i and we've, we've 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 got a great service but i'm really trying to figure out how i can really um, carve out a, a niche, so to speak, and being able to help them with the succession planning. Because so, there's some key elements there that I want to be able to to adopt, and and we've got a good service offering there. Um, but I I don't think that we've able to been able to get the word out as much as we'd like. And so going forward, that's something I want to do. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. And you mentioned some larger clients. To the extent that you're comfortable sharing, can you? Tell us how you found your ultra high net worth clients. Yeah. Um, you know, you just find them different ways, honestly. Um, we find that that's red ocean. So in other words, you know, that's where the sharks are at. That's where the blood's at is in those <laughs> ultra high net worth clients. So what we do is we um, we tend to, to work just kind of right under that, so to speak. And then those people um, become ultra high net worth. So I would suggest to, to you that our target hasn't been that. I was talking to somebody just the other day in our office, one of the partners, I said, like, I'm just not targeting that red ocean. That's let other people play there. It's very competitive. There's a certain cult of personality there. So we work under the ultra high net worth, just slightly under that. And then those we've had become our high net worth. So like somebody may have 10 million with us. And I, you know, people define it differently, these net worth numbers, but maybe 10 million uh, with us. And, and, and then they're like, okay, we've been with you long enough. Now we're going to bring you over 50 million. Okay. So stuff like that happens. Mm. So, or a guy, you know, I've, you know, you have 3 million. Okay. Now we're going to bring over the rest. So that's kind of how we play the game is like earning their trust. And then eventually we get family. We will get a lot of the other family or we'll get the trust account or we'll get the other stuff. So they start out like just below the ultra and then then they become they move up, so to speak. So mm -hmm. our target is not the ultra. We we just mm -hmm. that's just not our target, but our clients yeah. become that. That's that's genius, Daryl. I I've not heard that strategy yet. So that's that's really, really smart. How how do you identify these folks like the pre um, ultra yeah. and then get on their radar. Yeah. A lot of them are business owners. So you think about just okay. us being able to speak that language, so to speak. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of, them, um, we, we, one of the areas that I think is helpful to us is creating a system to be able to, to, uh, for the non CFO spouse to have a voice. So if we can help the non CFO spouse, usually the wife who's not privy to these conversations, about money really just spins or you know just trust her husband we need to engage with her and be a trusted resource um, if anything happens to that business owner um, she needs somebody to turn to and we want to be that person so that's really one of the uh, places that we try to um, put our foot in the door for the business owner because the business owner believes he can do it all on his own until we ask him and tell him we're doing this right now with an ultra high net worth client um, until we say, if something happens to you, she's not going to have a clue. Let us play a role in some capacity in your life. But once we do that and they realize that we're on the same team and we can prov provide value, the doors open. Mm -hmm. 
but it's really engaging with that non-CFO spouse and engaging and listening and hearing what's important to her and inviting her to the dialogue and to the table. Once we're able to do that, I think that allows us to really be an expert in that space. Hmm. No, another very clever strategy there, Daryl. Um, Daryl, I could literally ask you questions for the rest of the afternoon, but I will respect your time. Uh, we'll have one final question. Uh, the question is, what are you working towards? Um, oh, that's such a great question. I'm, I'm working towards the dad that God's called me to be a hundred percent. Yeah. I really, I mean, I really want to wake up one day and be, um, uh, uh be proud of how I've invested not in my company or even in the market, but how I've invested in the lives of my children. That's that's beautiful. And the conversation we had before the recording, I I would say you were you were on that path, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate awesome. That. Yeah. And and where can our audience find out more about you? Um Pax Financial Group, P-A-X, financialgroup.com. Um, I also have a podcast too, Retire in Texas. Um, so I do a lot of content on there. So there's a couple of places. Great. Awesome. We'll be sure to link to that in the show notes. Daryl, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. This was awesome, man. Thank you, Chris. It's an honor. I appreciate you having me. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. And to all the listeners out there, thanks so much for tuning in. Keep on growing out there, everybody. See you.